All right. Welcome to chapter 12. As the title suggests, this chapter is about the typical channel partners that manufacturing companies collaborate with for successfully executing their go-to-market strategies in the process of managing the place P of the marketing mix. Retailing is an industry in itself and a very important one. It's a huge industry and one of the mature ones. Uh, there are a variety of retailers with different retail formats that have evolved over time. This chapter mainly gives you an overview of the country's retail scenario and finally quickly reminds you of the role that wholesalers and agents play as channel partners. So by way of, by way of definition, retailing basically means the set of activities involved in the sale of products or services to the final consumers. Remember, final consumers, not B2B, not channel partners, but final consumers like you and me, people who use stuff for their own personal consumption. Hence, retailing includes the brick and mortar retailers, internet retailing, door-to-door uh, -door retailing, uh, uh, catalog selling, uh, TV network selling, even vending machines, anything that touches the final consumer. So point here is, from a marketing perspective, retailing is not just physical retail stores, but all the modes and activities involved in selling to the final consumer. Retailing also makes a significant chunk of our country's GDP, and its growth can be an important predictor of the country's economic well-being. About 10% of the U.S. population is employed in retailing and there are about 1.6 million retail stores. Though 1.6 million sounds big, it's really not. Uh, mainly because retailing is mostly in the organized sector in the U.S. with large corporations such as Walmart, Target, Meyer, etc. making up 85% of re retailing. Just to give you, give you an idea and comparison, India has about 12 million retailers. I'm not kidding, 12 million retailers. And mainly because under 5%, yes, under 5% of India's retailing is organized. And most retailers are small mom and pop stores. Lastly, a retailing scenario continuously changes and new retail formats keep emerging. There was a time early last century when most stores in the U.S. were small, called mom-and-pop stores. But now, most retail stores are very large, run by large and powerful corporations. Some decades ago, uh, the department store format used to be very popular. Now they are not all that popular. Retailing is fast moving to the online format now. So retailing changes as consumer behavior keeps changing. So the next logical question is, why do we have a variety of retail formats within the retailing industry? Why doesn't everyone just buy at Walmart, which, which has the lowest prices? Well, the answer is quite simple. Due to the differences in customer value that different formats offer, retailers focus on their respective target markets and try to differentiate themselves by offering higher and unique customer value. And customer value can come not only from lower prices, but from other factors as well, such as quality of the products, advice given by knowledgeable salespeople, or the shopping environment, the range of product variety called product assortment sometimes, service levels and after-sales service, conveniences such as clean bathrooms, plenty of parking, etc., etc. For example, Best Buy has very knowledgeable salespeople in electronics compared to other retailers. Party City offers a huge assortment of party supplies compared to other retailers, and so on. So now that we have talked about the possible differences across retail formats, here is a list of terminology that's commonly used in retailing, and four of their typical characteristics are also mentioned here, these different types of retail formats. Department Store, example, Macy's, Kohl's. Specialty store, example, Victoria's Secret, 
Ritz camera, coach bags, supermarket, examples, Walmart, Meyer, Target, convenience stores, examples, 7-Eleven, Circle K, drug stores, examples, CVS, Walgreens, Rite Aid, warehouse clubs, examples, Costco, Sam's Club, and off-price retailers, and examples would be TJ Maxx, Home Goods, etc. Another thing I would like you guys to know, if you wanted to find out the gross margins of different types of retailers, or even want to find out the operating expenses of different retailers, then this data is actually provided to all free of cost. You know where? This information is collected by the U.S. Census. Yes, the U.S. Census. And you can find that data for free at census.gov. So let's click on this link to see what data we are talking about. So it's taking up some time pulling up. So this is the data that Census provides you. So here are the on the left hand side you see all these different types of retailers which are there. Gasoline stations, health and personal care stores, grocery stores, family clothing stores, sporting goods, department stores, you name it. Non-store retailers, electronic uh, items and so on. And here is a uh, data for two decades and it was updated last I guess 2010 and here is the gross margins uh, showed for each different types of retailers. So let's see which retailer retailers have the maximum gross margins 30, 43, 46, 46 is that the highest number? No, 52.5 apparently is the biggest number. Yes, that's correct. So let's see which retailer makes 52.5 well, it's men's clothing stores. <laughs> I mean, they should tell you that men are not the most savvy shoppers in the world. <laughs> okay, so here is some more terminology you should know about retailing. As you, re as you read in the textbook, mass merchandising completely changed the retailing landscape in the last few decades, and it is still popular, even though category killers in various retail sectors such as Toys R Us, Advanced Auto Parts, Ikea, etc. They have emerged with tremendous success. This slide introduces you to the alternatives to powerful mass merchandisers in retailing. We know that U.S. retailing is very much dominated by mass merchandisers and the large retail format uh, accounts for about 70% of retail sales. So does that mean that there is no hope for not so big local mom and pop uh, retailers who might want to offer unique benefits to its customers such as fresh local produce or high quality customized goods or high levels of personalized service? In other words, can smaller retailers withstand the intense competition with powerful mass merchandisers like, right, like Walmart or Target? The short answer is yes, they can. There are three retail formats that you can read about in text as well that help smaller retailers to compete with big powerful players. The first format is that of cooperative chains. Here, cooperative chains, and they are retailer sponsored. In a cooperative chain, small retailers come together and operate as one large entity and standardize the marketing mix. For example, True Value Hardware Stores, where 5,000 retailers across the world have come together and operate as one. The second, form the second format, excuse me, the second format is voluntary chains, where a wholesaler leads a group of independent retailers instead of retailers coming together there's a wholesaler that takes the lead and it, it leads a group of independent retailers and they decide to have common operating procedures and a standardized marketing mix and a good example of uh, a voluntary chain is ace hardware stores 
So if you thought that Ace Hardware is one single company, like Target or Meyer, then that's not true. Ace Hardware is a voluntary chain. And lastly, consumer cooperatives. And these are probably not discussed in the textbook. They are a viable alternative to the cookie cutter approach of mass merchandisers. All the credit unions you see, uh, like, you know, uh, 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 the banks and everything, they are all consumer cooperatives. These are organizations that are owned and run by customers themselves. Only customers are called members there. These are very popular in Europe and Japan, and about 20% of retail sales in Japan, uh, they are uh, conducted through consumer uh, cooperatives. One of the biggest and visible consumer cooperatives here in the U.S. is REI. You might be familiar with this, Recreational Equipment Incorporated, that retails outdoor gear. So if you thought that REI is a large corporation, just like Walmart, run for profits, that is not true. It's an organization owned by its own customers. So to sum it all up, marketers need to be aware of the various types of retailers out there and choose the ones that fit their own unique marketing mix best. Not all products need to be sold at a Walmart or other such stores. Finally, all marketing students should be familiar with franchising, which is a very popular, uh, which is very popular in the services sector. In franchising, a franchisor such as Subway or McDonald's develops a marketing strategy and opens more outlets in collaboration with franchisees and they share profits. And franchisees, they buy into the business model and invest their money into it. Franchising can be a great way of starting your own business actually and work for yourself. It is often said, franchising means working for, for yourself but not by yourself. If you go to franchising.com by following this link, you can go there and that li this link is available in Blackboard as well, you will notice a wide variety of franchise opportunities available there. The investment required ranges from as little as 20000 for a franchise like Bricks for Kids or even less sometimes to as much as a couple of million dollars for a large McDonald's franchise. You can also look for, you know, if you click this link, you can look for franchising opportunities in Michigan. Uh, and you know uh, you, you, you can see if some one of them interests you. Even large uh, product manufacturers have tried to enter into franchising to take advantage of opportunities. You probably don't know but uh, Procter & Gamble offers two franchises in the market. Mr. Clean Car Washes named after Mr. Clean cleaning products and Tide uh, tri, uh, uh, Dry Cleaners, Tide Dry Cleaners after its flagship product, Tide Detergent. I would like to reinforce this. It doesn't matter what you are interested in. Education, music, sports, science, food, art, you will find a franchise that fits your interest and budget. So you must definitely explore this option of running your own business. So these are some of the popular franchise businesses you see around you. And there are, of course, thousands of uh, more there out there. Lastly, here is some information on wholesalers and agents. We did discuss this in chapter 10 earlier, but I thought it would be good to revise now that we are talking about retailers. So give it a quick read and make sure you understand it all. And in case you're interested in knowing more about retailing, we have Dr. Anna Walls who teaches the course on retailing here at Seedman College. And you can contact her through, through her email if you want. So here are the two key messages I would like you to remember and here are the key terms you should understand well after reading this chapter. That's all in retailing. Now I need to go to my favorite retailer Meyer and shop for groceries. Thank you for listening and have a great rest of the day. Bye.